we move on to uh, our um, uh, poster session. Um, we have three really interesting talks. Um, and I'd like to introduce Hannah McGrath as our first speaker. She's a final year Waitrose PhD student at Rothamsted Research in the University of Reading. Hannah works closely alongside Hunter Pack Produce and her project focuses on the role of flowering strips in carrot crops, looking at how they can support pest control and pollination, as well as the trade-offs between those, these services and commercial practicalities. So although the information Hannah's talking about today is from carrot crops, uh, she hopes she'll be able to find similar themes within other arable and horticultural crops. So over to you, Hannah. Thanks, Neil. Hopefully you can see the screen there as well. Um, so let's kick off. Um, today I'll be focusing on the harvest results of my field trial and the economic impact of the flowering strips on carrot crops. Um, so why are we even putting flowering strips in the Well that's because carrot growers face the problem of aphids vectoring viruses into their high value crops. A potential solution to this might come in the form of conservation biological control. And this works on the principle that by providing natural enemies with shelter, nectar, alternative food and pollen, we can build up the numbers of these beneficials, which can then move into the crop, predate the aphids, which are transmitting the viruses, which can cause the ultimate yield losses. Um, so this is what my field trials look like. Uh, we've got the flowering strips running the length of the field here. And you might be able to see as you look along the length of the strip that the colours of the flowers change. And this indicates the different seed mix treatments that we're trialling to see which is the most effective at supporting pest control within these carrot fields. And for one question of things from the molecular through the supply chain, and it's this harvest data that I'm presenting today. Now, in particular, with this harvest data, we're looking at identifying what the yield, quality, um, and any economic impacts um, or incomes from the carrots immediately adjacent to these strips are. And thinking back to that virus, we're also considering, are there any seed mix treatments which have fewer virus carrots associated with them and therefore better quality or higher yield? Now to assess this, we sampled four meters squared of carrots next to these strips before washing each of these carrots and grading them to commercial specifications and identifying any reject carrots, any carrots that are defect. So what does the kind of data that we uh, get look like? So um, this, day, this table here um, shows you on the left hand side, we've got different treatments. So uh, we've got at the top a carrot control. So this is an area of carrots grown without flowers. And then below that, we have five different flowering seed mixes represented by the letters. Now, the first two columns as we move across this table are metrics of quality, so it's kind of dark gray. The first shows you the percentage of a sample which has got those virus affected carrots. And there are no significant differences between the treatments here, suggesting that no seed mix is more effective at reducing virus transmission to carrot. Mean percentage pack out, um, and this is a kind of measure of the percentage of a sample which would have been able to have been sold as kind of grade one supermarket carrot. Now there are significant differences between these um, for the different treatments, but this is likely due to the presence of other defects within the crop, such as fungal pathogens. Then next, in kind of dark blue, we've got two yield measurements. So gross yield being the mass of all of the carrots that we've harvested when scaled up to tons per hectare, and then net yield. So what could have been sold? And that net yield comes from the gross yield multiplied by the pack out figures. And then finally, we've got two columns that represent some economic values. To calculate these two columns, we've used a representative figure of 40 pence per kilogram of washed carrots. Um, and that's a figure that we've uh, got from the industry. So we're looking here at the mean values of the cost of the virus losses in pounds per hectare, as well as the mean turnover before any costs would be taken off. Now, there are no significant differences in the cost of the virus losses, but there are significant differences in that last column in turnover, where treatment F has a significantly lower turnover than the others, and treatment B significantly higher turnover. So what's this table really saying? Uh, well, uh, whilst in this field and this year we've not found a flowering strip treatment um, that we can use to reduce virus, uh, flowering strip treatment, sorry, that can be used to reduce virus damage, we have developed a methodology that we can use to quantify the impact of management decisions upon the crop, and that's obviously useful to my own project, but to the carrot industry um, more widely. 
And then just to finish, which I think um, a parting thought, which builds on a lot of the previous talks, is um, in summer 2020, I've conducted much bigger field trials over four fields where we had large areas of carrot that were sprayed and then unsprayed with insecticides. And um, from the data that we're analysing from these trials, we are currently unable to find a difference in the amount of virus damage in these sprayed and unsprayed areas, suggesting that in the 2020 field trials, the insecticide applications aren't effective at reducing aphid vets and virus damage. And if we put some economic numbers on this, growers are facing maybe £650 worth of losses due to the virus, even with a full spray regime. But the spray regime itself costs £400. Now, when we consider that the turnover from maybe £20,000, it leaves us with some kind of interesting uh, decisions to make. And this is, you know, building on what Keith said about biologists aren't very good at risk. You know, and I think this is something that we can maybe pick up in the Q&A box is, you know, around the idea of what motivates growers to spray, given that these horticulture growers are reliant on being able to fulfill a supermarket contract to make money. Are they spraying for ease of mind and insurance or because of the need of a pest in the field? How are they perceiving these um, yield and income stability um, that they might get from spraying versus the potential of an increased turnover um, within their IPM decision making process? And then lastly, I would just like to say thank you to those involved, obviously my um, academic supervisors, and um, particular thanks to the Hunter Pack Farm team who've been so willing to um, come up with these ideas and, and let them travel out in their field. So thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Hannah. Very useful. And I hope you get some good questions over the, the lunchtime break. So thank you. Uh, introducing our next poster. This is from uh, Dr. Alice Morklin. Alice is uh, another ex Rothamsted PhD student, actually, who's currently senior research fellow at the School of Agriculture, Policy and Development at the University of Reading. Alice is an insect behavioral ecologist working on sustainable crop production. And she'll explain her work on clean fruit, which is an EU funded project that aims to standardize pest control strategies to deliver zero residue fruit. So, over to you, Alice. Okay, thanks very much, Neil. Um, yeah, so um, I'm presenting today on behalf of my colleagues at the University of Reading, um, and we've been working with colleagues at the University of Turin, colleagues from um, Juvedan and Dola, who are sort of fruit um, processing uh, companies, and Group OAM, which is a cooperative working in Spain, um, and also Copper and Biological Systems, who I'm sure you're familiar with. And we've been working um, this year on an EIT food funded project called Clean Fruit, um, looking at standardising pest control strategies to deliver zero residue fruit. Uh, how do I move on a slide? There we go. So um, the reason that we've um, devised this project and we've run it for the first year um, is to try to tackle the problem of pesticide residues in fruit. So pest control in fruit is heavily dependent currently on chemical pesticides and all the associated negative impacts on food safety perceived by the consumer and also environmental concerns. Um, and from a report in 2016, um, EFSA concluded that over 77% of strawberries and over 60% of apples um, contain residues of at least one pesticide at the point at which it reached the consumer. And fruit processors are very um, interested and buy large amounts of zero residue fruit, in particular for the, the baby food market. But increasingly, there are labels um, on the continent um, for zero residue fruit um, as a whole that can, consumers can buy um, at, at retailers. So it's not only just for baby food, which has this very specific requirement for zero residue pesticides um, at all. So there is currently increasing interest in developing sustainable means for pest and pathogen control in both strawberry and apple crops um, that can reduce impact on, on food safety concerns that use beneficial organisms and, and deliver um, improved ecosystems. So the Clean Fruit Project aims to develop and promote this concept of a standardised zero residue crop protection strategy for both strawberry and apple, combining both early season use of chemical pesticides but with the sort of approaches that we've talked about today that are common to IPM approaches using biologicals, biological pesticides, commercial pollinators and innovative pest um, detection tools. 
And during the global pandemic, uh, we conducted field trials during 2020. Uh, unfortunately, the trials in the UK and the Netherlands weren't able to go ahead, but somehow our colleagues in both Italy and Spain were able to conduct trials on commercial farms, both on strawberry and apples in northern Italy and apples in Spain. Um, and there, in collaboration with both growers and with Coppert, um, consultants and technicians in the field, we devised customised um, zero residue strategies that we compared with commercial um, conventional plots so that we had these zero residue versus control plots on, on commercial farms. And at the end of the first trial, and I must stress this is our very first pilot year, um, the zero residue uh, on strawberry and apples didn't have any impact on the quality parameters that we measured on the fruit, such as acidity, firmness, shape and weight. Um, and in terms of the strawberry trials, um, accompanied with good agronomic practices, um, the zero residue plots were able to um, reduce the incidence of some of the main pathogens. Um, no significant differences were found between the zero residue and conventional plots in terms of pathogens. The treatments were just as, as effective. Um, however, a fossatile aluminium based product that was used early in the season was detectable at the end of the season. So that's something that needs to be tweaked in future, in future trials. Um, and for the pests in strawberries, the beneficials that we used were effective at controlling the insect pests in those plots. Sorry, this is a very quick whiz through of the results. Um, and in apple trials uh, conducted in Italy, uh, the, the, my colleagues there tested both Gala and Jeremine apples. Um, and they're in the plots with a very low uh, incidence of the main uh, apple pathogens um, and no yield losses were, were, were seen during the trials. And in also the coddling moth was managed with mating disruption and the woolly apple aphid was effectively parasitized in the trials. However, after cold storage, um, we did some post harvest assessments of the apples and found black spot um, was more prevalent in the zero residue um, produced plots. So again, that's something that needs to be tweaked um, for a zero residue um, protocol in the future. Um, and there were some residues on the Jeremy apples in the zero residue. So we didn't manage to effectively produce zero residue by the end, but all of this is work in progress and we planned to uh, tweak these in the future. So alongside running the field trials this year, we ran two um, surveys, one of growers. Um, we're very interested to understand growers' attitudes towards this concept of zero residue production that falls somewhere between organic um, so we have an, an ongoing grower survey so if there's anybody listening that would be interested in completing that there's a link here and also on the website that's listed at the bottom and we'd be very interested to, to hear your thoughts and the, the initial results we've had back in on that has indicated that um, costs uh, of the treatments and concerns over efficacy were important barriers um, but they are interested growers are interested in looking in reducing their environmental footprint um, and to meet demand for for low and no residue fruits and European consumers in five countries, the survey there showed that they would be willing to pay more for zero residue products than conventionally produced products um, because they're very interested in, in moving towards or looking for zero residue fruit. So that was a very quick um, whiz through. Um, thanks very much. And if anyone's interested, the website's there with further information. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alice. That's uh, excellent, thanks. Uh, I see there's some questions already coming in. Um, but I'd just like to introduce our final poster, and that's presented by uh, David Garthwaite. Dave joined the pesticide usage survey team in 86 and was responsible for its management between 2009 and 2017. Dave now works as a consultant, um, but is still very much involved in the production of the UK pesticide usage reports. Um, he previously worked actually on uh, with, the, with the Crop Protection Association in 2001 and 2004, uh, which was sort of during the formative years of what became the, the voluntary initiative. Um, and that work considered on-farm operator training and sprayer testing, which helped to develop Neuroso and NSTS that we've already previously mentioned. Um, in a previous research life, in the late 70s and 80s, Dave worked at what was then Rothamsted, Rothamsted Experimental Station on pea moth and midge pheromones and developed traps to monitor populations and develop thresholds to optimize spray applications. So David, over to you.
Right. My apologies for that. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're all good, David. Yeah, good. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd just like to sort of briefly go through some of the work of the, the pesticide usage surveys and the, uh, the role in which we, we also collect information on, on buyer control. There's about sort of 50 years worth of, uh, of uh, data that we've collected. The surveys were sort of started in 1965. Uh, because of concerns over um, organochlorine usage. Um, but as part of the data we collect, we treat uh, biocontrol, uh, either macrobiologicals, microbiological, as, as just another application. So it's really useful to, uh, to, to get that information. Obviously, biocontrol is only sort of a small part of, uh, of IPM. Uh, we do also collect information on crop assurance schemes, uh, things like uh, seed varieties, uh, seed rates, drilling methods, and, uh, and the use of crop covers. And for the first time this year, we're going to be doing um, um, a full IPM survey on the, uh, the arable growers that we, uh, we contact. So hopefully that, that will be published later on in the year. So that'll be really interesting. So the surveys are funded uh, via a charge based on the, the turnover of product registration. So as a company puts its... Um, uh, product through the manufacturing system, uh, manufacturer puts his product through the registration system. Part of that money is used for post registration monitoring. We're based at uh, Ferris Science at uh, Sand Hutton, but we have colleagues in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and we coordinate the three survey teams and produce the UK reports. Uh, CRD has overall management of the pesticide usage surveys. Uh, the data are used for a number of use of uh, purposes, so for registration and monitoring purposes and responding to queries, uh, mainly from government, but also from academia, industry and the public. And we're, we're answering somewhere in the region of about 100 to 120 hours of queries um, every year. So quite a lot of use of the, uh, the data. All the surveys are based on the June survey returns, the DEFRA June survey returns. And we take a representative stratified sample, stratified by farm size, which varies according to the survey, and uh, government office regions. Key thing about the surveys is, is that they're all voluntary. And despite this, we still get an 80 to 90% uptake rate. Over the last few years, we have managed to uh, provide participants with um, CPD points for both Neuroso and uh, Betis, which is great. So these are the, um, the key surveys that we, we currently conduct. We've conducted lots of other surveys in the past, uh, but this is the, uh, the main sort of six commodity areas that we now look at. Uh, all of the surveys are conducted uh, biennially, uh, with the exception of grassland and fodder, which is done every four years. And what I've done here is just sort of laid out the number of farms sampled in each survey from the most recent survey data and then express the area grown on those sample farms as a proportion of the total area grown. And although it looks quite low on the, um, uh, the arable and grassland and fodder, there's about 4.2 million hectares of uh, arable land and about 11.5 million hectares of, of grassland and fodder. Percentage of area grown goes up as we look at um, the horticultural crops, uh, mainly because of the greater diversity in the different um, approaches to um, uh, pesticide use within, within those areas. And for most of the horticulture surveys, there's sort of 25% or more. When we look at biocontrol, and I've split biocontrol into three, three areas, macrobiological, which is living uh, biological control agents, microbiological, this is formulated uh, products containing things like um, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis or Bacillus uh, aminoquifaciens and uh, physical control, which make the, um, uh, the environment for the pests uh, more, either more in, inhospitable or um, uh, they act as a, as a repellent uh, within um, you know, their area of use. And you can see for the most recent arable and grass and surveys, we, we didn't encounter any biocontrol of this type. Obviously, that's not to say that there's no IPM going on on those, uh, on, on those farms but there was no biocontrol. We have encountered um, 
uh, things like nematodes used for um, some high value early potatoes. And we have encountered garlic and uh, rhizobia loculums uh, used in both of those, those sectors. But you can see in the horticultural crops, there's a significant uh, usage of, of biocontrol, particularly in those crops that have got um, a lot of protection. So the edible protected crops, that's permanent glass house, permanent polythene, 57% of the total treated area was made using uh, biocontrol or um, you know, in each of those in each of those sectors, it's quite high also for soft fruit, mainly because of the usage of um, of Spanish tunnels, particularly for strawberries, raspberries, and uh, and blackberries. And uh, we've got increasing areas; they're still quite low within with our outdoor veg and uh, and also um, uh, and also orchards. So, if you look at the the individual uh, commodity, you can see the relative proportions of the macro, micro and physical control agents. So the living biological control agents are, are most prevalent in the edible protected and soft fruit surveys. Um, obviously having an enclosed environment is ideal for using uh, living organisms. Uh, there's quite a bit of usage of physical control within outdoor veg and there's a lot of um, microbiological usage within, uh, within soft fruit, uh, particularly Bacillus uh, amelioquifacians, which I'll say a little bit more about in, in, in a while. Looking at the orchards, there's quite a mix there, and that, that's quite an interesting area. We've come across um, uh, usage of uh, macrobiologicals, so anthocorids used to control pear sucker uh, in some of the crops that are sampled. We look at uh, changing usage of biocontrol over time. Um, prior to 2010, we were doing the four-year cycle of surveys. 2010 onwards, it was a two-year cycle of surveys. But you can see from 2001, steady increase in the usage of biocontrol, which is great. A uh, bit of anomaly in 94 and 98. And I think this is mainly to do with um, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis, thuringiensis usage uh, within orchards. But it's a good, uh, good positive message. As I say, we come across in the soft fruit survey a lot of usage of Bacillus amelioquifacians. This used to be called Bacillus subtilis, uh, strains QST713 in most cases. And um, the interesting thing is it's, it's used for um, botrytis control and it's used as part of a proper integrated pest management um, program. So you've got conventional fungicides being used uh, beforehand and you've got conventional fungicides being used after the applications of Bacillus amelioquifacians. It wasn't recorded prior to 2010, um, but from 2010 onwards it was, uh, it was, it's been encountered in every survey. It accounted for about 4% of the fungicide treated area in 2010 and that's increased to 7% of the fungicide treated area in 2018. So really interesting. So in conclusion, my apologies for rushing through this and um, probably wittering on a bit too much. The use of biocontrol was first recorded in 1968. So this was sort of in Carcia, Phytocelius, and its usage has increased ever since. Since 1994, uh, usage of in the form in the horticultural sectors, biocontrol has more than doubled. And the key thing is that there's always potential for greater use of biologicals as new pests and diseases emerge and conventional actives are lost. And we find that in every um, uh, survey we do, we find e either new organisms being used or new methods of, of dealing with, um, with problem pests. So I'd just like to thank all of the, well, probably hundreds and thousands of, uh, of farmers and growers that have participated in the surveys over the years. And thank you very much.